Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Y'all, I am recording this, or at least the first part of this, we'll see how far we get, in my dressing room at Mount Gretna Theater, where I'm currently doing a run of Great Balls of Fire that runs through this weekend. And uh, yeah, I decided I would just kind of set up my mic in the dressing room and and start working on Zoo News here. So uh, that's what I've been doing. Mount Gretna is this amazing venue. I love playing here. It's a uh, theater that is in a, I don't know if this is a state park or what, but there's all kinds of cool, you know, hiking trails and and pretty places and uh, like a lake that you can swim in and stuff. And um, there's this indoor-outdoor amphitheater. It has... Uh It has a roof and um, the backstage area is completely indoor, but the actual stage and stuff is is outside, but you're you're in the roof and it's like, it's very cool. It's very charming. My personal favorite part of it is that um, people walk their dogs by and you can actually like see the dogs from the stage. It's amazing. I've seen like a hundred dogs today and that puts me in a very, very good mood. And I need to tell you that part and that I'm in a good mood because I also need to tell you that this is one of those weeks where there's just a lot of bummery news that I am going to be throwing your way. Um, bummery is the the technical term. And uh, yeah, this is just one of those where like as I was jotting down the stories, I was frustrated at the um, the number of negatives and, and that's okay and that happens sometimes. But I did want to warn y'all just in case you're maybe not in the best headspace right now or something like that, you know, that's okay. You can come back to this one. Um, I do try and keep it as late as I can and I still have my jokes and there are good stories. I just, this was one of those that as I was typing it up, I was like, oof, I need a break. So uh, so I took a few. So yeah, just wanted to give you a heads up. But don't worry, there's lots of happy births and some other good stuff too. So it's, it's not all bad. Yeah. But um, that's what this episode is going to be. So just so you know. And speaking of this episode and what it's going to be, in case you're new here, this is Rasafari Zoo News, and uh, it is a crowdsourced Zoo News program. And uh, that means that people send me or tag me in stories and then get their names said at the end of the episode, uh, which is pretty fun. So if that's something you'd like to do, uh, of course, you can tag me at Rasafari on socials, at Rasafari Pod on the TikTok machine, um, or email me things, rasafaripod at gmail.com. Com. Of course, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss any Zoo News episodes or any of my Tuesday interview episodes. And uh, with all that said, I think it's time to get to it. All right. So you may remember that I said I had been working on a headline story for last week, but then new information was coming to my attention as I got closer to time to record. Uh, And so this is that story. Um, All right. So a story broke two weeks ago that sadly isn't getting a lot of attention, but it's one that I want to bring to the forefront for our community. It's a story that was researched and shared by One News in New Zealand, who spoke to over 20 current and former zookeepers while working on the story. The person who shared the story with me is in direct contact with one of the whistleblowers of the story, which made me even more confident in the reporting. And while this story takes place in New Zealand, keep in mind that this kind of thing can happen everywhere. This is, frankly, uh, the story of a possibly, we'll say allegedly, bad zoo. And because I work so hard to share the stories of good zoos on this podcast, I think it's important to pause for a second and share the other side. 
And this story is particularly challenging because this isn't some roadside zoo. This is a facility that is accredited by the Zoo and Aquarium Association Australasia, which is known as the ZAA, but is obviously a different ZAA than the accreditation body we have talked about when talking about places like Southwick's Zoo, Bright's Zoo, and Wildlife World Zoo and Aquarium on the podcast. Uh, the place is also accredited by WAZA, which is the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So based on those accreditations alone, this is a facility that under normal circumstances, I would go to expecting to be excited and encouraged by being there. And honestly, that's enough for me to be interested in featuring them, you know, for an interview on the pod. Um, But instead, I'm here to discuss a different thing about them. So the facility in question is Orana Wildlife Park. It's a zoo in Christchurch, New Zealand. It's a facility that, along with those accreditations that I mentioned, has a 4.4 star out of 5 average rating across multiple review sites. They have a small following on socials, only a few thousand people between the main sites, but they do have a following there. They are the only facility in New Zealand to house gorillas. On their website, they brag about their conservation work and say they are internationally renowned for their involvement in zoo-based breeding programs for endangered species. In fact, they are involved in 39 programs between the ZAA, WAZA, and the Department of Conservation in New Zealand. But keepers at Arana are saying that the public face of the zoo is just a facade for a facility that doesn't properly care for its animals. For instance... Three keepers spoke about the time that Mahali, a gorilla that was normally rambunctious and playful, had gotten very sick. He was barely moving, was eating so little that his ribs were showing and his belly was sunken. He was holding his head and dripping snot and daily showing more and more medical issues. But when the keepers talked to management about their concerns for him, they were ignored. Eventually, according to the keepers, the manager did decide to intervene and to get a vet involved because this is one of those facilities that does not have an on-site vet all the time, but instead uh, bring one in like once a week and then also have that vet on call when things happen. Uh, But the day after the initial tests were conducted, Mahali died. A necropsy showed that his death had come from an incredibly rare bacterial infection. Could an earlier intervention have saved him? Possibly. It's That's actually very hard to say because of how rare this infection was. Um, and this alleged story is just one of many that former and current keeping staff shared with the press. Some of the former staff were former staff because of quitting the facility over welfare concerns for animals or because they felt so burnt out from fighting with management over basic issues like animal health and proper staffing levels. In another story shared by staff, a giraffe suffered an accident involving the caging in its habitat that caused it to dislocate a bone in its neck, which caused it to fall and suffer internal damage. This happened overnight, and by the morning when staff arrived, the giraffe was dead, lying bloated in the giraffe yard as traumatized keepers looked on. And as sad as that is, that is the kind of thing that can happen. Hoofstock accidents happen, and keepers of all types walk in to find beloved animals that didn't make it through the night for whatever reason. You've heard many of those stories on this podcast. Now, in this case, the zoo was determined to open fully to the public at 10 a.m., their normal start of business, and they didn't want the giraffe habitat to be closed off at all. Therefore, two maintenance workers were tasked with getting the body out of there, having to improvise a way to drag the carcass away to avoid any public disruptions. As if this story isn't disturbing enough, the zoo's press release on the topic said the giraffe had died of an unsurvivable medical condition. But it was not a medical condition, according to the staff that spoke to the press. It was an accident. And they happen, but the idea of handling it so poorly and then lying to the public about it is just not a good look. On top of that, the keepers who were interviewed said it felt very much like a cover-up to them, which they felt disrespected a beloved animal. And I'm going to 
stop with the horror stories there. Uh, but there are others, some of which, as I read through them all, felt like normal deaths at zoos and the, the sometimes tragic kind we talk about on here seemingly every week, uh, but they are just that. Sad, tragic occurrences that happen. And uh, the crazy thing about all of this is that it was super well documented. Photos and communications have been leaked to the press. And it turns out that over the last decade or so, staff at the zoo have reached out to other zoos trying to get them to intervene in the welfare concerns of animals. They have also reached out to the ZAA and WAZA, reached out to the government agency overseeing the zoo, and even emailed an organization named WorkSafe, which is a, you know, work safety situation. In fact, some keepers went as far as emailing one of the major sponsors of the zoo, encouraging them to pull funding unless things improved. And according to the keepers, all of this led nowhere. At one point, back in 2018, eight keepers quit their jobs in the space of two weeks, sending the park into chaos. The keepers were clear that they were leaving because of animal welfare issues, as well as understaffing and bad management. When the board of trustees met to discuss the issue, the keepers that quit were branded as ringleaders and foot soldiers displaying constant bad behavior. All of their concerns were dismissed, and the zoo decided to temporarily fill the roles of the zookeepers with maintenance workers, volunteers, and students until they could hire more qualified staff. Now, I need you to understand that many of these keepers were carnivore keepers working with dangerous animals. The Ministry of Primary Industries, the government agency in New Zealand that is tasked with overseeing animal welfare, happened to do their annual inspection at this time. They did cite the zoo for having untrained exotic animal staff, but since there was a hiring plan in place, the zoo was allowed to continue with their operations. And again, this is a part of the public record. The, the agency in charge of animal welfare said it was totally cool that the untrained maintenance workers were serving as zookeepers for exotic animals because there was a plan to get more experienced keepers hired. Unbelievable. And of course, all stories have two sides to them. Um, the uh, facility in question, Orana, has answered a lot of these concerns, saying that the, the staff was lying, blaming the staff for some of the animal deaths, and uh, in other cases just saying that the staff was only, you know, cherry-picking the stories that they shared. Um and, you know, while I am often one who trusts keepers, especially when it's a good normal number of keepers, like 20 of them that are speaking out, uh, I do need to at least mention that after this story came out, uh, there, there was an inspection of Irana. That's actually what delayed me talking about this for a week. It was a rapid animal welfare assessment that was conducted by, you guessed it, the Ministry of Primary Industries, the same people who signed off on the inexperienced keeper plan. Uh, but I do have to say that the agency did find the park to be, quote, fit for purpose, meaning the park passed the examination. In fact, they said there was zero evidence of any animal abuse that they could see, although there was one underweight tiger, but, you know, that can happen. The MPI has, however, committed to doing more checks than just their regular annual inspection to make sure that Orana doesn't have any issues. They have also told the zoo to turn over all animal welfare records to the department for investigation, though this will take a lot more time. So there's still a chance that the government agency will find problem with this park. But uh, for now, the government is giving Orana a clean bill of health. So the question becomes, what gives? Many of those who spoke out about the issues believe the government is covering for the park, but that's pure speculation on their part. I don't have an answer here. For now, all we can do is sit back and watch what happens. But I will say this. It seems incredibly unlikely to me that 20 keepers are lying about their experiences. 
And uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that for now. And that brings us to our births for the week. The Yokohama Zoo has announced the birth of no copy, the first ever successful breeding of the species at the facility. The little okoplet is doing quite well, hanging out with mom and learning how to be an okapi. Now, my guess is that, you know, it's 2024, so the tech in okapis has probably gotten pretty good by now. I'm guessing that this thing will require less charging time and function at a higher level than any of the other fake... Oh, no, wait. They are real. I keep forgetting that I've met one now. Ah, darn it. (laughs) Anyway, the Idaho Falls Zoo has announced the birth of the first ever fennec fox kit in the zoo's history. Born to parents Jojo and Finnick, the baby has been named Sahara. Sahara is already showing off a playful energy and plenty of curiosity and is absolutely adorable. The Monterey Bay Aquarium has welcomed two tufted puffins to their colony. These pufflings, which admittedly is almost as good as pufflets, which is what I would call them, are growing up on exhibit and are currently just little balls of floof that you can go and see. Well worth taking a gander at. And uh, finally, in births this week, a snow leopard cub has been born at the Toledo Zoo. His name is Murphy, and he was born to Greta and Shashir. He was born weighing in at 6 pounds and has grown to 9.5 pounds already. Just just, just under 10 pounds of, of little snow leopard. I love it so much. Also, mom is doing a great job with the little one behind the scenes right now. So uh, when, when uh, Murphy gets a little bit bigger and is on exhibit, that is going to make a trek to the Toledo Zoo well worth it. And then that brings us to our deaths for the week. And uh, we start off by saying goodbye to two beloved red pandas. Sequoia Park Zoo has announced the passing of Sumo, a 15-year-old red panda. As Sumo aged, he faced many of the expected challenges for an older panda, including mobility issues that led to habitat readjustments, physical therapy, and medication for pain management. In the last week, these treatments seemed to stop having an effect, and Sumo's rapid decline led to his passing. This father of three will be sorely missed by his keeper team. And then we have some breaking news uh, just released before I I finished up the recording of this. Sakura, the 10-year-old red panda at the Toronto Zoo, has passed away. Now, We've been talking about Sakura's journey on here for a while. Uh, She recently moved to the Toronto Zoo as a retirement home, but it was discovered she was pregnant. She gave birth to two cubs, uh, but it was discovered she was suffering from neurological issues, so the team had to switch to partially hand-rearing the cubs, co-parenting with Sakura. But unfortunately, one of the cubs passed away. Sakura passed away overnight from a cardiac arrest, and at this time, the zoo isn't quite sure what caused it. It could be part of the neurological issues they faced, or it could be something else entirely. The remaining panda cub, nicknamed Biggie because of being the bigger of the two cubs that were born, uh, well, she has transitioned well from part-time human care to full-time hand rearing. So, that's that's the good news in this story because ah, we need some good news in this story. I am just sending all the love to the team at the Toronto Zoo who have really been through it with the red pandas over the last few years. And for this next story, we have a returning guest, uh, a voice that has been far too long gone from this podcast. G'day, John. It's your old bogan mate, Ren Howe, from down under. It's been quite some time since I've sent you a bit of a recording. And in that time, my life has significantly changed. First up, I do have my own little koala fast asleep on me right now. No, John, I'm not saying I have a pet koala. It is my darling daughter, nine-month-old little Tilly Bear. She is absolutely adorable and thriving. About a month ago, I did return back to work after maternity leave. However, I have not returned back to your favorite little mate, Kofi. So I have actually made the transition across to Sea Life Sydney Aquarium, where I am now Penguin Supervisor. This means that I am now working with our colony of King and Gen 2 penguins. That being said, it does not mean that I will not see your buddy, Kofi, 
And as you are aware, you will still be receiving quality Kofi content. But because I have made the transition across to sea life, unfortunately I am reaching out with some sad news. Earlier this month, we did in fact have to say goodbye to one of our Gen 2 penguins, Sven. So Sven actually shot to fame back in 2018 when news of his same-sex male relationship with Magic made global headlines. They were dubbed the power couple and they were an adorable and loyal duo who celebrated six years together. They successfully adopted and raised two chicks, Svenjik in 2018 and Clancy in 2020. Sven and Magic are more than just a beautiful love story. Their impact around the world as a symbol of equality is immeasurable. They inspired a Mardi Gras float. They've been included in the New South Wales education syllabus and even featured in the Netflix series Atypical. Countless books speak of their love story and even documentaries on same-sex animal couples have featured Sven and Magic. Through Sven and Magic's fame, Sea Life Sydney Aquarium has been able to share important messages on conservation, plastic pollution, global warming and the importance of protecting wild penguins through fundraising initiatives. Sven and Magic shared a bond unlike most other penguin couples. They could even be seen together outside of the breeding season, which is quite unique for Gen 2 penguins. Sven, the older of the two, was nearly 12 years old when unfortunately he passed away earlier this month. With breeding season upon us, and in order to help process the loss, we actually enabled Magic to see Sven after his passing. After seeing Sven, Magic started singing and vocalising. This was soon reciprocated by other members of the colony in a beautiful symphony of penguin singing. It was really quite a touching and emotional moment, and I don't think there was a dry eye amongst the staff in that penguin habitat in that moment. We want to take this opportunity to reflect and celebrate Sven's life, remembering exactly what an icon he was and the unique bond he shared with magic and the positive impact he made all across the world. So with that being said, John, I really appreciate your time and allowing me to celebrate and share Sven's life with all of your listeners. Cheers, mate. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Oh, it was so good to hear that voice again, right? I love Ren. It's so cool that she's in this new position. We might, we might have to have her back on. But anyway, moving on. The Pittsburgh Zoo and Aquarium has announced the passing of one of the most unique animals in human care and one of my favorites when visiting there. Ellie May, the northern elephant seal who called the zoo home, has passed away. Ellie May was one of only two northern elephant seals under human care. She was found beached and malnourished in California back in 2017, and when the people caring for her realized she was unable to hunt in the wild, the zoo took her in and gave her a forever home. I always loved seeing Ellie Mae, and once had the pleasure of taking a working dog in training to the Pittsburgh Zoo. The dog in question was named Talon, and Talon and Ellie Mae played for hours, having a great time together. I will cherish that memory, and I send my condolences to the team at the Pittsburgh Zoo. Edmonton Valley Zoo has announced the passing of Tyga, a 16-year-old Amur tiger. At her advanced age, Tyga started suffering from osteoarthritis and spondylosis, which led to decreased mobility. Tyga was known for having an outgoing personality and was often called Goofy by her keepers. She loved back scratches, 
uh, through a fence and with a back scratcher, of course, and had great relationships with her keepers. Her presence will be sorely missed. The Tulsa Zoo has announced the passing of Shitari, a female African lioness that called the zoo home. Shitari began end-of-life care way back in the summer of 2022, but the zoo was able to keep her quality of life high with incredible care until last week when she started to decline, so the correct and humane decision to euthanize her was made. She was a sassy lioness known for being feisty and owning her world. The team will miss her greatly. And then last but not least in deaths this week, our friends at ABQ Biopark have announced the passing of Mimi, a loggerhead sea turtle that lived at the aquarium. Last week, she was showing signs of distress after her yearly egg cycle, so she was transported from the aquarium to the zoo to get testing. While the surgery was taking place, surgeons discovered that there was no chance to fix the myriad of problems she had internally, so the decision was made to euthanize her on the operating table. She was estimated to be around 75 years old and will be greatly, greatly missed at the bio park. And moving on from births and deaths, we get to the rest of our zoo news section. And yeah, we have to address the elephant in the room. Or, you know, the tiger in the room, as it were. A woman climbed over a barrier at the Hohansic Zoo in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and acted... weirdly? towards a tiger. There is video of the incident, and it shows her, as the police put it, enticing the tiger. She puts her hand in the fence, and it looks as though the tiger, who is very stressed by all of this, uh, tries to take said hand off her. Now, she jumps back, uh, but then tries to reach in again before jumping back and ultimately walking away. Police are asking people to try to help identify the idiot in question because what she did is illegal and she deserves to be punished. And the thing that really gets me about this is that if anything had happened to her, there's a real chance the tiger would have paid the price for her stupidity. Of all the dumb stuff that people do at zoos, and there's a lot, this kind of thing is the tops for me. It sets me right off. Now, I'm going to go off on a huge rant right now. No, I'm kidding. We already had one of those. Um, and this episode has enough tough stuff in it. But uh, suffice it to say, I hope they catch her and feed her to the damn tiger. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. But I do hope they catch her. On a lighter note, Newsweek has announced their top 10 zoos as voted on by readers. And as always with any of this stuff, I have to drop the caveat that any fan voting on something like this is pretty silly, especially given that most people haven't been to more than like one or two of the zoos on the list. Uh, but I do think it's always interesting to, to look at these. So according to Newsweek readers, your top 10 zoos in the United States are number 10, the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans. Number nine, the St. Louis Zoo. Number eight, the Cincinnati Zoo. Number seven, the San Diego Zoo. Number six, the Alabama Gulf Coast Zoo. Number five, the newly renamed Denver Zoo Conservation Alliance. Number four, Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. Number three, the San Antonio Zoo. Number two, the Memphis Zoo. And number one, our friends at the North Carolina Zoo won. Woo! We love the North Carolina Zoo. Now, again, you know, my thoughts on these uh, polls are, are always a little bit, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a bit off. But I actually have to say, I don't hate these as a top 10. Like, not at all. It's, it's the, the order isn't what I would do. Um, but, but you know, and there are some zoos that are missing. I don't know about that zoo in Alabama. I've never been there. Columbus is missing, obviously. Cheyenne Mountain is missing. There are a lot of great zoos in this country, fortunately. Um, but, but yeah, as far as these fan voting lists go, it's not half bad. All right, and moving on from that. Cleveland Metro Park Zoo has announced their updated plans for their new gorilla habitat. Now, we've talked about this before, that they would be installing an outdoor gorilla habitat at the current rainforest building, but uh, the plans have surprised me a bit. As it turns out, the rainforest is going away to, to make uh, space for this new habitat. Guests have until September 9th to get in a visit to this incredible, incredible rainforest before it's gone forever. 
And this is one of those things that I know is ultimately in the best interest of the zoo and the animals that live there, especially the primates that will have an incredible new habitat to visit. But I'd be lying if I said it doesn't make me a little sad. The the rainforest at the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo is honestly one of my favorite places at any zoo anywhere. It's a two-story building that houses a variety of animals, from an incredible herp collection to their binturong and clouded leopards to otters and orangutans and more. It also features an incredible aviary that always seemed to have some birds that were willing to basically pose for photos. Some of my best photos of bleeding heart doves and taracos have come from there. It's one of those places that you can truly lose yourself in while you're there. And I know because I can't count the number of times I've done just that and then had to be told the zoo was closed and I needed to leave. Uh, So yeah, if you have even the slightest chance to get to the zoo before September 9th, I recommend you do. And go check out this incredible space for the last time. It's it's worth a trip, honestly. I'm, I'm so bummed that it's going away. And uh, speaking of um, (laughs) bummers, we've been tracking the pregnancy of our friend Isla the Tamandua at the Cincinnati Zoo, who had the first ever recorded twin pregnancy among Tamanduas in human care. And we recently found out that an ultrasound showed that only one heartbeat remained. And now the zoo has announced that Isla gave birth to the remaining pup prematurely, and due to this fact, it was unable to survive. The other, less developed fetus was still present and birthed at the same time, and the zoo is unsure if that was, uh, you know, a factor in what happened. They, They don't know right now. But Isla is doing well, and the team is paying lots of attention to her to make sure that she continues to do well. And last but not least in Zoo News this week, we have another follow-up, though this one's of a happier nature. Uh, Last week, we talked about the fact that a baby gorilla had to leave Woodland Park Zoo because her mother abandoned her and none of the potential surrogate mothers there were interested in the job. Well, now it has been announced where that baby has gone. The baby, named Abeo, has gone to the Louisville Zoo, uh, where they have a great record of fostering gorillas. So congrats to Louisville, and uh, just, you know, thank you to Woodland Park Zoo for doing the thing that is the best for your animal. Yay! All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon. How did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Conservation, conservation, news time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Aussie Ark has been doing incredible work for the animals of Australia for a while now, and the list of species they take care of keeps growing. This week, they announced the start of an incredible insurance population of a new-to-them species. The animal in question is the endangered broad-toothed rat. However, given the dislike some people have for rats in general, Aussie Ark is working to rebrand the animal, if you will, calling it the Pygmy Wombat, because it does. It looks like a little wombat. The program is the first breeding and rewilding effort for the species ever, and we wish them the best as they get the ball rolling. This is something that they have been working on making happen for a long time. So this is a big deal for Aussie Ark. Very cool. Now, on a less happy note, an oil spill has given birth to a second oil spill off the coast of South Africa. A ship known as the MV Ultra Galaxy, which sounds like a crappy Android phone, uh, ran aground back in early July, spilling some oil into the water and sparking a cleanup effort that has been fairly successful as far as these things go. At least until recently, when major storms hit the area, tearing the remaining bits of the ship apart and sending significantly more oil into the water. Over 200 additional staff have been brought in uh, to assist with the cleanup. But this is an area with a lot of marine life, including penguins. So conservationists are bracing for some scary work needing to be done when all is said and done. Organizations like Sankob are standing by ready to assist the animals that need it. 
I just, I just can't believe we still have things like this happening frequently in the world. And honestly, I don't even see it getting any coverage, at least in the United States. Honestly, seriously asking you right now, did you know that there was an active oil spill a month ago and that there was another follow-up one recently, especially if you didn't see the post by Sancom? Uh, let me know if you did. I'm I'm honestly curious to see what the reach was outside of that one Sancom post. And I'm I'm guessing it's it's not very much. And then um, okay, so our final story in conservation news uh is a uh it's a unique one. We'll call it a unique one. The Smithsonian Institution is looking into a conservation initiative I've never even kind of thought of before. <laughs> we all know that cryobanking is a great way to save genetic material to ensure there is a repository of genes for future conservation efforts. And that's what the Smithsonian is looking into, with a twist. They're trying to figure out if they can do their cryobanking on the moon. The moon's permanent shadow craters are cold enough for cryogenic preservation without the need for electricity or liquid nitrogen, so it would make a perfect storage place for the genetic materials. The idea is to start with a lunar biorepository that would target the most at-risk species on Earth today, but the goal would be to expand until almost every species on Earth would be preserved there, on the moon, like the moon of the Earth. I, I guess that would be one small step for conservationists and one giant leap for cryobanking or something? I don't know. Anyway, that brings us to... It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, then now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to... The Spirit of Tasmania Cruise Line will be launching a new ship in 2025, and it will have 18 cabins allotted to dogs. Dogs will be allowed on the cruise ship. There will also be areas on the ship that are dog-friendly, so walks and exploring can happen. So if you've always wanted to take a cruise but were worried about what to do with your pups, now you don't have to worry. And yes, there will be climate-controlled kennels for when you want to disembark and do cruisy things away from your furry friends. Although those of you that I know that are obsessed enough with your dogs to take them on a cruise probably don't want to do any of the things that you can't do with your dogs. I get it. I do. Uh, anyway, uh, in another story, every so often we get stories about lobsters that are really rare colors, like peaches, the bright orange lobster that was caught in Maine last year. And no, I'm not going to repeat the peaches joke from last week. Uh, a lobster is born with an orange color roughly once in every 30 million lobster births. But peaches is actually trying to improve those odds. So far, she has given birth to at least 40 offspring that share her unique color. Along with orange offspring, Peaches has also given birth to multiple blue lobsters, which is more common than orange, but still rare. One in roughly every two million lobsters is born blue. It's really cool to see these rare genetic colors being passed on. And last but not least in other news, it seems that Emily the Elephant and I have inspired a famous copycat. Famed cellist Yo-Yo Ma recently went to Glacier National Park, where he played cello for a herd of newly reintroduced bison. Okay, this had nothing to do with me and everything to do with his project dedicated to promoting and celebrating ecological healing. Ma admits that he doesn't know if the herd heard him playing or if it had any impact. But the peace and joy that he took from the experience alone was worth it. And you never know the impact something like this can have on animals. Maybe he should offer them his bow next time. Worked great with Emily and a drumstick. Animal. All right, it is August, which is Asian Elephant Awareness Month, National Catfish Month, National Parks Month, and August is for Antelope Month. And then we don't have many holidays this week. The 26th is National Dog Day and World African Painted Dog Day, which seems like double dipping, but hey, whatever. And then the 30th is International Whale Shark Day, and those are your animal holidays for the week. All 
Alrighty, so that brings us to the end of the episode. And of course, I want to take a moment here to say thank you to my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Lara Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, Jenny Owens, and Kevin Williams. Thank you all so much. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed stories this week, including Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley Croninger, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Emily Rockbuck, Anna Martins, Dr. Lara Shank. Ali Malensky, K. Malensky. The Malenskys. Matt Patford, Dr. Zoe Rossi, Crystal Chapman, Lynn Vesley Gross, Dylan Hoy, Justin Williams, Tiana Bush, Melissa Reed, Ren Howell, and Yoshioka, and of course, last but not least, yes, I'm Charles. Yes. Hmm. And with that lovely, lovely impression of a good, normal British accent, I'm a professional actor, y'all. I'm going to leave you with this quick reminder that the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steiderk Yeswen. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. Sorry, no outtake this week because I crushed the recording of this one, y'all. Whee!